in life, we have moments of time to tell people how we feel. When we tell people how we feel, we're really looking at how do we feel, how do they feel, how does God feel about what we feel for each other, and openly, we're trying to figure out how do I tell someone I love them. You see, when we fall in love, we fall in love for quite a while. When we truly deeply fall deeply in love, we fall in love for probably a lifetime. And when we fall out of love is when we start listening to other people tell us things, seduce us, try and solicit us to do something else or to be with someone else or to go somewhere else. And that sort of makes it difficult. When someone is hitting on our relationship, we are literally not paying attention. It's not true. We're paying attention, but we're not doing the right things. If someone I love is actually married and hasn't communicated that, then she's sort of been ill-willed and that she has not clearly articulated, I'm actually now married. But that sort of a conversation between people who have a love relationship, whether it be in a friendship or whether it be in a business partnership or whether it be an actual loving sort of concept where someone went out to dinner with someone, someone took someone to lunch and there was sort of a bit of a longing and a bit of a lingering and a bit of a love affair going on intellectually or psychologically or emotionally really needs to be a sit down conversation. I have certainly received only a few letters in my lifetime that were sort of like a Dear John letter, but the reality was I didn't actually buy it. Because what I know about women is they sometimes want to push back to see how much does someone really care about me? How much does someone really want me? And I can tell you, I would have driven to North Carolina if the Lord had allowed it. But in life, we don't have time to do that sometimes. We have to deal with what we're dealing with, we have to finish up relationships we're in, and we have to be clear 100% that once a relationship is over with, it's possibly over with. But at the same time, I had a loving partner who was still sort of calling me, still sort of soliciting me, still sort of begging me to come abroad and live overseas again and be that man in that part of the world. And the truth is, I just wasn't really ready for that again. I knew that our time together was precious. I knew that our time and our life together was worthwhile. I knew that I had a valuable family in a Japanese partner and a Japanese son or stepson. But the truth is, what I was looking for was no longer what I was finding in her. And I think she also felt the same. She made a choice literally to leave and made a choice to visit home. And when she did, she literally made the choice not to come back. Now, when you think about it, that's pretty impactful to a person's life. That's pretty huge in a person's life. And openly, it's sort of not clear, clear why someone would do such a thing. But it does happen that people start to reflect on their life and where their life could head. And they think, well, maybe this is as good as it gets. And at the same time, they sort of long for something a little bit different, a little bit better, a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more intellectual, a little bit more emotional, a little bit more psychological, a little bit more sexual, perhaps, a little bit more physical, perhaps, but in truth, a lot more spiritual, as usually where people are headed. When people are looking for a soul for a relationship, they're looking into the eyes of one another and they're saying, hey, I sort of think that your soul's pretty great and I'd like to have your soul in my life a lot longer. Or I'm not really willing to let your soul go out of my life because I can't function with it gone. Now I'm about to sneeze. <coughs> Sorry, this is going to be an authentic video, but that's what you live when you're living outside in the elements of the world. Now last night was sort of an interesting evening. I spent the night sort of participating but not really paying attention to an event that was going on that I sort of wanted to see, but it wasn't really something for me. I wasn't really participating because I was enjoying the music, but I really wasn't watching the show. I was actually watching the Muslims and the other folks who were in a particular demographic come by with such looking like hatred on their face that I was concerned for the safety of the people who were at the event. And I literally was sort of paying attention to them. Now, I wasn't stalking them by any regards. I was just sort of paying attention. I was letting them see some of the signs that they know in their culture of don't even motherfucking, excuse my language and my French, Lord, Think about crossing over that line and doing any damage to any of these gentle, loving people in this event. And that's sort of what a guy does when he's trying to pay attention to what's going on. At the same time, I had to kind of surmise that it's also very possible that I was misreading a face, that someone might have gotten a horrible text message of someone not being willing to uh, get together for a meetup, a pickup, a, I don't know what they're called nowadays, and it's sort of funny. But openly, openly, there are lots of humorous ways to tell people that you really value them. I sort of joked with a little girl the other day who just felt like she had to buy me a piece of pizza. The truth was, I wasn't hungry at all, but I loved that particular pizza because it's one of the rare types that I can actually eat without having a gluten reaction. And it's sort of good. But at the same time, 
I really appreciated the fact that she cared enough about my life and about my willing, uh, my ability to eat that she wanted to sort of surprise me with a slice. And so that was kind. I've been wandering around looking for her because I'd like to gift her something in kind return for her kindness to me. And hopefully that's my lawful right. The challenge that I have right now is that while I'm away from my storage unit, not getting in, not going and looking through my belongings, I know for 100% fact that someone is violating federal law, going into my property room, and literally stealing me blind. I know this because I have found these things that I had lovingly put in special boxes to keep them safe and clearly unharmed in my property bags that I'm carrying with me. I literally am missing a large gemstone that I've been carrying for three years in my pocket. And only one day the Lord said, take it out and leave it in a bag for right now. I don't know why he asked me to do that. I don't know if he wanted that person who's been lying and stealing and cheating me blind to get caught with it, but it's a large diamond looking thing. It was supposed to represent my love of someone. And openly along with it was a beautiful heart rock that I had literally purchased at a special event just for that individual. Also along in that bag were some beautiful little heart medal, uh, medallions that were angel verses and even a uh, particular type of a logo, I think, was also in there. I also had put in there some coins and some other part of my personhood with regard to my bank accounts in Japan because if they steal those type of things off me, they're actually violating international banking laws and that's the stupidity of them. I've had three coins now that were gifted to me by my previous spouse that were collector's items taken from me. I'm pretty sure that my father's presidential coin collection was totally destroyed by someone putting them in ketchup while I was in jail, unfortunately, because of someone's lie to themselves about what they did or didn't have to do to protect my life. And openly, when I got them back, they looked nothing like they did originally. It looked like someone had tried to polish them up or clean them up, and I didn't want them done that way. I wanted them left alone with the grime and the history of my life. The reality is I've left most of those gifts from my loving father in storage. I've left a shirt that was mine, bequeathed to me from his military days. I've left some coins in there. I've left a holder that I've had for years in there. The problem is every time I go back to my storage, I find things of mine that I purchase with hard-earned dollars, discretionary income, completely gone. Completely gone, totally gone. I have a lovely little red cut rock sort of collection of tigers that I purchased overseas. You can't possibly find them here, gone. I have a lot of Asian things, completely gone. Now who gives anyone the right to do these things? Who gives anyone the right to walk into my storage unit, which I have set aside mainly for one person, my legal heir and her loving children, her boys in fact, and go in and take those items? Not only are they stealing from me and stealing my wealth, if you will, things that I could liquidate to live out my, out my days, or things I could liquidate to provide for her life if she loses her job, or things I could liquidate to provide for her boys to go off to college for a year, at least, depending on where they go and if they go locally. But the reality is someone is stealing those things from children. I have a lot of books in a religious library that I acquired over the course of time, and I've read most all of them. But there were some I hadn't finished reading. There's some that I wanted to use for making lessons in the book that I've been writing on behalf of those children of the one I love. And openly I'm a little leery of looking in my bags because that person who stole that big diamond looking glass item, who stole that loving rock, who stole those coins, those things that I had been carrying literally straight for three years in my pocket so that I could hand it to her and say, this is how big my heart is for you stole that, but they also stole the original diamond that I earned on my own accord by giving a reading to a loving other type of reader who owns a gem shop. And they replaced it with a piece of, of glass, and then they stole it all together once I said that in some video commentary. You see, the people who want to play on my life don't get one thing. I never gave them permission to put me in any place. Now, if the Lord did that in my driving behavior all over the Midwest, well, that's on God. But the truth is you can't outplay the Lord. And every time someone tries to put something over on me physically is when the Lord says, time to move, get up, go, now. I also get guidance on how to make sure that I am safe so that when my love comes to me, when she finally wakes up and smells the bacon, or when she finally gets it, 
you know, maybe she just hasn't been kissed the right way. Or maybe, just maybe, she's terrified, completely terrified, to be kissed by someone who loves her the way that I love her. Because, you know, there are women like that, that they're afraid to be loved. They're afraid to let go. They're afraid to drop their guard. And literally, she did drop her guard with me. Nothing intimate, like, uh, of sexual nature happened. But the reality is there was still an intimacy that she was calling me literally almost every single day. While she was going through her struggle of a surprise divorce. Now, did I get told prophetically that she was going to get a divorce? Absolutely. I was literally walking in my kitchen. I had just gotten a text message or a phone call from her. And I remember saying to the Lord, Lord, I love that woman. And the response was very clearly, she is going to get a divorce. And I just didn't believe it. I just didn't buy it. But I also had that woman to my home many times after my own partner went off to work. And we would spend time talking or planning or trying to get her life back on track. But, you know, divorce is hard. It's hard to let go of what's going on. It's hard to believe it's over with. It's hard to think that you can't fix something or remedy something. But once that divorce is final, God hoping after all this time it's final. But once it is, you've got to be willing to open yourself up to the people that God aligned your life with in those moments of time. And the reality is that I really think she's a coward in a lot of ways. And that's not really kind to say about someone that you love, but the reality is that when a man is being gifted by the Lord something so profound that really came from her originally, you have to wonder, what the hell is she thinking not to want to come and see what I'm capable of doing? Not just hear about it for girlfriends she might send by me, or not just hear about it from the play of police officers who think that I'm a joke, but the reality is I really find whatever I need to find for my life and my education from God every single day. And I don't have to be ashamed of saying that. It doesn't make me mentally unwell. I literally could document every single situation that has protected my life because I just listened to the Lord saying, do this now, please. The other day, I had the most amazing experience and that literally I got told, get up from the library right now, leave. Then I got told to pause at a place where I typically pause because of my heart and I need to make sure that it's still bumping and I'm not overdoing it at my age and I'm not going to get a heart attack as my mother is always fearful about. But the reality is that I stopped to linger and a beautiful woman, probably in her early 70s, stepped out of a little sports car with her dog and came over and just started chatting at me. And I thought, okay, we've either got someone who's a little mentally unstable and her husband or someone has left her alone not to her own devices or... She really is this loving, sort of outgoing sort of girl. Now, she was dressed just like the way that my love dressed one time when I took photographs of her and her boys. And I literally could have died. She had on a cross, so I know she was a holy person. And she just said, when I asked her, why did you come over to talk to me? She said, because your energy is so good. And I was sort of blown away by that because I'm in shitsville most of the time. But the truth is, I'm happy and content. I once made a video that talked about that I love to travel, and the truth is I do. I meet some amazing people. I meet some incredible people. I meet some folks with great stories. And I also met in that moment of time when she finally called her husband who was coming out of the gas station where he was paying the bill or doing something to come over and meet me. I met Mike Ahern. Now, as a trained journalist, you know what that's like? It's like meeting a superstar. This is a man who retired 15 years ago and was on air for like 37, 38 years. And I literally watched him with my father almost every night on the nightly news.